You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. As we all build out our social media profiles and online presence and gain followers and, you know, have more information about us published online, we will in, in some ways approach where these celebrities are today within the next 10 years. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me as always is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. How are you? I'm doing great. And as always, we've got some interesting stories to share. Later in the show, we'll have my interview with Stephen Frank. He's the Director of Technology and Security at the National Hockey League Players Association. And we're back. Joe, uh, got some interesting stories to share this week. I want to start off by asking you, have you ever had someone contact you online with the promise of romance? I have never had anyone contact me online or offline with the promise of romance. <laughs> You're a happily married guy. Yes, I am. Must, must have happened some sometime <laughs> along the lines, I guess, right? <laughs> Back in college or something. But at any rate, I have certainly received friend requests on Facebook from... Oh, yes, I have gotten those. Yes. Uh, friend requests and Instagram requests. Yes. Young women usually with alluring photos yep. uh, or telling me how lonely they are, you know, uh, and they're just looking for someone to talk to, uh-huh. some, uh, someone to, <laughs> a shoulder to cry on, right? I'm sorry. My, my youth has made me jaded and suspicious towards this. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and inevitably those accounts are uh, brand new accounts with no common friends. And so, you know, they go right into the trash bin. But right. uh, imagine it, it happened in a different direction. Imagine someone started impersonating you online using your image and your identity as the foundation for a romance scam. Hmm. Now, lucky for both of us, neither of us are strapping, you know, tall, chiseled, good-looking guys that, that <laughs> right. probably use us as, as, the, uh, as the basis for a romance scam. Talk about something going right in the bin. <laughs> there you go. But there's a gentleman named Brian Denny. He's a career Army officer. He's a veteran of Desert Storm, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Operation Enduring Freedom. And this story came to us from the Task and Purpose website, which is a site that caters to folks in the military. It's written by David Leffler. And so Brian Denny started getting messages on LinkedIn and on other social media sites from strangers. And these were women that he'd had no previous relationship with. And they were asking why he failed to show up for a planned meeting. Hmm. Turns out that uh, the scammers had been using photos of him that they'd gathered online, and they'd created hundreds of fake accounts for him. Some of them used his real name, some didn't. So imagine you've got this handsome man in uniform, and everybody loves a man in uniform. Right. And they'd create these fake accounts on Facebook and other places, and they'd just reach out to women, and they'd say, similar to what I described earlier, you know, I'm a guy looking for uh, some companionship, uh, I'm lonely. And uh, in this article, they actually contacted one of the women that was a victim of this. Her huh. name was Sharon Hughes. She's a 65-year-old retired nurse and divorcee. And she got drawn into this. She she got divorced back in 2003. Okay. And she was looking for someone. So she's um, been single for quite some time. She's been single for a while. And, and she was uh, she'd put herself out there. She was hoping to find someone. So imagine in her inbox uh, come these pictures of a uh, a handsome gentleman, man uh, of, of great character, uh, who, you know, helps defend our country, upstanding guy, and uh, just starts with regular, just casual conversation. Uh, and it doesn't seem too good to be true, does it? It seems highly plausible. It Well, I suppose that the random contact out of the blue right. from someone you don't know would, would certainly tip someone off. But you can understand how someone who is... Maybe lonely and looking for a companionship. Someone pops up out of the blue and says, hey, I, I came across your account here on Facebook and uh, I just wondering if uh, maybe we might chat a little bit. Yeah. You know, what could possibly go wrong? Right. So over time, uh, she developed an online relationship, what she thought was an online relationship, and she actually ended up sending him over $35,000 in cash and electronics. Wow. Yeah. Reached out to him. And wondered uh, why he didn't show up for their first meeting, because as far as she was concerned, the two of them were engaged. Huh. So never met, 
online relationship, tens of thousands of dollars. Yep. The promise of uh, an intimate relationship. Yeah. And the whole thing was a scam. That's sad. It is sad. It's interesting how they can amplify it online. Right. And and how it can lead to the point where people have uh, sent tens of thousands of dollars to people they've never met just because these scammers provide the victims with something they need, some kind of affirmation. Right. They influence them. Well, they make them feel good. Right. And if you're lonely and, and here's someone who, reaching out and you look at the pictures and, and you, you start to create this story in your mind. This woman said that her friends were telling her it was too good to be true. I mean, she was out house shopping for the two of them. Really? Yeah. Wow. She couldn't bring herself to believe that this was a scam. And this is, you know, this is, this is an educated woman. She's a nurse. Like we say, you know, everybody has something that they could fall for. That's what uh, Chris Hadnagy was saying in our in our very first episode was that there's something out there that's going to get that will work on any of us. Right. Right. So if you if you're a scammer and you go out there, you can look at it from the sales point of view. I had a uh, a very brief and failed sales career early in my <laughs> early in my career, but one of the points uh, in sales was if you ask enough people, one of them will say yes. Yeah. Right? And and look yeah, and it's a numbers game. Yep. I think hundreds and and of course uh this gentleman uh Brian Denny, now he's dealing with the fallout. Right. Now he has to deal with this as well because he's essentially been the face of this scam, right. the the persona behind it, they've taken his identity in a way. They may not have stolen, uh, you know, a social security number or any other real information that can harm him, but his good name is now out there being besmirched by these scammers. Yeah. Well, it, it's a cautionary tale and, and a reminder to reach out to your loved ones, particularly uh, these uh, scammers tend to focus on older people who are single and uh, it's easy to find them online. Right. So it's, it's good to check in, <laughs> just check in on your loved ones and make sure that they're OK and that uh, these sorts of things, are, I, just warn them about them. Right. You know, like it's, we said, you know, education, it sort of inoculates people against these things. Yep. You know, just being exposed to how these scam artists operate can help you not fall victim to it. Yeah. Another example of, of how the uh, online social media can make stuff uh, look too good to be true or, or things that are too good to be true, they can they can be convincing. Right. All right. What do you have for us, Joe? All right. So recently, last month, actually, we had the second flood in Ellicott City. Right. Um, Ellicott City, Maryland, a historic town. There was lots of damage. National Guard Staff Sergeant Edison Hermond was killed trying to help somebody. These events have a big impact on us. Uh, right. You know, we went to Ellicott City as kids and hung out there. Yeah, this is um, a, this is my hometown. Right. Uh, I've taken my kids to the Railroad Museum there. We are emotionally invested in the area. And it's a beautiful town. Yep. Now it's been damaged in the floods. So this emotional investment is really why it's important to us to understand that people are out there who will exploit that emotional investment. Right. And WBAL's Megan Pringle had a story on their website where she interviewed Angie Barnett, who is the president and CEO of the Better Business Bureau of Greater Maryland. And Angie Barnett was saying that in 2016, shortly after the floods, there were websites that were set up as charities, but they were, in fact, scams. Mm. They were just ways for you to send money to somebody. Uh, and none of that money went to help anybody in Ellicott City. It just went to enrich somebody else. Yeah, it's interesting because in the in the hours and days after this natural disaster, you saw lots of GoFundMe sites pop right. up, you know, for the workers at the restaurants who aren't going to be able to work for months while they're cleaning up the mess, for the, the owners of the buildings to, to, uh, yeah. to fund rebuilding, um, for and, the tenants of the apartments upstairs. Yep. Well, GoFundMe has created a page for verified campaigns and for businesses that were damaged by the flood. So you should definitely check out that portion of the GoFundMe website first before you send money to GoFundMe because anybody can set up a GoFundMe page. Right. It doesn't require any verification at all, but they are offering this verification now so you can use it. The state of Maryland is helping out as well. The state of Maryland, correct. Well, the state of Maryland, actually, Attorney General Brian Frosch and the Secretary of State John Wobensmith were advising people to be aware of these scams. And they, the state of Maryland actually maintains a public registry of charities that are allowed to solicit for donations in Maryland. Hmm. So you can check out that site as well and make sure that where you're sending your money is a place that is recognized by the state of Maryland and is a valid charity. 
in your desire to be helpful, to help people in their moment of need, you got to sort of check yourself and take that extra moment to do the research to make sure that who you're sending, before you click online, and it's so easy to do, right? that it's actually a legit organization. Absolutely. So, you know, outside of Maryland, I guess you'd have to check with your local state government, local or state government, rather. Right. Better Business and Bureau. Better Business Bureau, absolutely. And uh, there are organizations like Charity Watch out there that you can check and make sure that what you're giving to, or you can just make sure that you're giving to a well-established charity that you know is vetted in something like the United Way or the American Red Cross. Sure. All right. It's a good one. Time for our catch of the day. So, Joe, I was sitting here in my office minding my own business the other day when my cell phone lit up with an incoming call. And since it was not a number in my address book, I did what I suspect most of us do these days. I sent it right to to voicemail. voicemail. Right, Right. exactly. (laughs) So So imagine my surprise when I check the message, and here's the message they left. Notification regarding your tax filings from the headquarters, which will get expired in the next 24 working hours. And once it gets expired after that, you will be taken under custody by the local cops as there are four serious allegations pressed on your name at this moment. We would request you to get back to us, so that we can discuss about this case, before taking any legal action against you. The number to reach us is 360-680-1232. I repeat, 360-680-1232. Thank you. Well, needless to say, I got on the phone and called them right back. (laughs) And you, and you sent the money before they arrested you, well, right? Of course, I did. Yes, I, I, I don't want to do any jail time. Who knows? No. I, uh, yeah, I gave them everything they asked for. So what, what, what do we got here, Joe? So they're using a an automated voice generator system to impersonate some law enforcement organization. My right. favorite thing is that they actually call them the cops. Yeah, instead of law, enfor- <laughs> instead yeah, of the law cops. enforcement, police, right. or Lingo. sheriff's office, mm-hmm. it's the cops coming to get you. Yeah, Cheese it, the with, cops. Right, with a synthesized voice, right. which is a tip-off, which, which I guess speaks to uh, behind the scenes, this must be highly automated. Right. Yeah, actually, you know, that's that's probably a great point is that they can they can hit more people with these machines than they can by sitting on the phone and telling them. They're just trying to cast a wider net. Right. So the call to action. The call to action, yeah, you better hurry up or it, you got 24 hours, 24 working hours. I don't know if that means three days or one <laughs> one cycle of the sun. I have no clue. They probably, they probably don't care very much as long as you call back. Right. They've invoked the IRS. The IRS. And, and the police. And the police. And you've got four charges against you. You mm-hmm. better hurry up. It's, you know, it's obviously a scam. Yeah. But, the, but the thing is that we know that someone out there – is still responding to these calls because they're still making them. Right. Because if these calls were not productive, they would not make them. Right. Yeah. There's still these economic forces that are in play. So they're sending these calls out and somewhere it's working. Right. Right. Well, it's a, like we say, it's a numbers game. If I send out, a, you know, if one in 10,000, right. because the cost to make the call is, is practically zero. Right. Uh, so why not? Yeah. And if I get one out of 10,000 people, I've made a couple thousand dollars. Right. Right. And I can make a thousand calls, 10,000 calls in a day, maybe. Yeah. So I mean, it's the voice over IP that's really, uh, you know, the capability of, of somebody to have a telephone number anywhere in the U.S. And I did look up area code 360, and mm. that, that's in Washington State. Mm-hmm. So that is an American area code. It, yeah. It looks like an American telephone number. You know, I was originally, I was thinking we would uh, bleep out the number, but uh, no, no. Uh, no. Give them a call, everybody. <laughs> if it wants to, uh, <laughs> anybody wants to give them a call, I, we, you know, I, we, we've, we've considered uh, calling them and putting them on the air, but uh, being in Maryland, we're in a two-party consent state, so uh, we can't just record phone calls. Right. But, uh, but if you want to have fun with these folks, uh, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we can even encourage that to happen. Yeah, probably not. Never but, mind. <laughs> Never so mind. don't call them. Right. Don't Please, what, call whatever them. you do, don't call them. <laughs> do not call them. All right. That's our catch of the day. So coming up next, we've got my interview with Stephen Frank. He's the director of technology and security at the National Hockey League Players Association. All right, Joe, we are back. And earlier this week, I had the opportunity to speak with Stephen Frank. He is the Director of Technology and Security at the National Hockey League Players Association. That's the organization that takes care of the players. I guess that's the union side of the the hall, right? Yeah. Yeah. Players Association, typically the union. 
Right. So uh, they look out for the interests of the players. And uh, it's an interesting thing because, you know, professional athletes, they've got a big target on their back when it comes to people trying to scam them. Right. Well, they, they're well known. They have and everybody knows they have a lot of money. In fact, a lot of times everyone know exactly how much money they earn. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so here's my conversation with Stephen Frank. I oversee development, infrastructure, and support. So uh, all three of those uh, departments report up through me. Set the table for us. What do we need to know about professional athletes that's different from uh, folks like you and me in terms of people who are trying to come at them and perhaps to trick them? Well, I've always said this, that uh, professional athletes or people of celebrity status represent where we'll all be in 10 years' time. And the reason I say that is because these individuals are in the public eye. They're high net worth individuals. Information is fairly easy to come by in terms of, you know, knowing their likes, dislikes, their hobbies, uh, their charitable donations, et cetera, et cetera. So these are individuals where a lot of information can be gleaned online about them and used in many ways against them. When I comment about these are individuals uh, that will represent where we are all in 10 years as we all build out our social media profiles and online presence and gain followers and, you know, have more information about us published online, we will in, in some ways approach where these celebrities are today within the next 10 years. So describe to me, what is it like for someone coming up through the league? Someone comes out, it's, I'm sure it's been a lifelong dream to be a professional athlete. Now they are. But I suspect this side of it, uh, that people are going to be coming after them, is perhaps unexpected. Somewhat unexpected. I mean, for the most part, uh, these athletes and or in very in many cases, celebrities, they're coached and receive guidance along the way through their junior career up through until they, you know, take birth into the NHL, the big leagues. But the shortcoming here is, you know, many of these players and or celebrities really don't have what I would call a corporate affiliation. They haven't been trained in the ways of cybersecurity. They're not used to the policies that many corporations employ. So when it comes to, you know, operating on their home computer or using consumer grade accounts or the like, uh, they're not well versed uh, in the ways that, you know, normal corporate employees or staff employees are uh, throughout their tenure or career. So take us through uh, what you all do to help try to protect them. Well, I mean, the NHLPA has taken the stance uh, of protecting uh, its membership, both uh, in terms of uh, licensing the likeness of the individual. We uphold the collective bargaining agreement. But also, when we look at the world of cybersecurity, uh, we make available to our members various discounted software endpoint protection. Uh, but most importantly, and in the interest of the players as well, is their marketability online and maintaining good online uh, hygiene. Uh, so this can include uh, all their social media channels, Twitter, their Facebook, their LinkedIn. So we utilize uh, a product that protects those social media channels, uh, Zero Fox, uh, based out of Baltimore. Uh, and we use it, uh, you know, in a way that allows the membership uh, to receive notifications in the event uh, there's an account breach, uh, an impersonating account, or perhaps, you know, retweeted uh, links that contain malware this sort of thing. And, you know, the players understand, for the most part, the value of their brand online. Uh, so it's in their expressed interest to protect that and maintain uh, marketability with respect to activation and marketing and sponsorship deals. Can you give us some examples of, of the kinds of things that they have to deal with when, when people want to target a professional athlete? How do they do it? Well, there's quite a few ways. I mean, one way is through, uh, I guess, misinformation or uh, in a way that suggests that a particular player, athlete or celebrity endorses a product when in fact they don't. Uh, you know, this is akin to a, an impersonation of sorts, completely violation of the terms of service. Uh, and through the various products that we employ, it detects and notifies the player and the player is able to execute uh, a takedown uh, through the platform, remediating uh, the issue. Secondly, with respect to any player or celebrity online, uh, they acquire quite a few followers and this becomes a community and they want to ensure that the various links, retweets don't include malware and that their, you know, their channel remains clean with respect to the followers or the community that they've built for themselves. So that's a second way that the ZeroFox platform helps the players is it ensures that, uh, you know, these malware links uh, are efficiently removed and, uh, you know, staves off uh, any issues with respect to impact uh, to the community for the player. The third way we get involved as an association is in the event that there's uh, online impersonation, someone pretending to be that athlete. 
Uh, of course, that detracts from their overall brand as there's someone actually trying to control their brand, which is not them. And in some cases, uh, you know, players may uh, see as many as 150 to 200 uh, impersonating accounts. Uh, so again, you know, in the express interest of the athlete and their marketability and online hygiene, uh, and a platform was able to remediate that by removing uh, all those impersonating accounts and, you know, provide them with that one true voice that represents, uh, you know, their brand, uh, their image, their likeness. Now, I, I suspect that, uh, you know, you have a spectrum of players in the league and different players probably want to uh, have different levels of involvement in their own social media, you know, writing their own tweets or their Facebook posts or things like that. But other people may be, uh, you know, having helpers to help with that. Can you sort of take us through what, what is the spectrum there and, and how does that play into the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, players, like anyone else in the business world, are extremely busy with respect to travel and, and their engagement with their respective club uh, in the league. They do uh, resort to assistance. And in some cases, you know, some players are very hands on with respect to their own social media. In other cases, uh, you know, they refer back to an individual that helps them build out that online profile and presence. And I would say it's basically a 50 50 split. On the same side, with respect to security, some players are very actively involved in their own manageability of their security, and they take action uh, on their own alerts to maintain uh, that online brand hygiene. In some cases also on the security side, uh, players resort to uh, handlers uh, and or individuals with good uh, security focus. In some cases, the NHLPA becomes involved. And effectively, what is involved there is more of a white glove treatment where the player in question uh, requests we take a particular action and the NHLPA or handler takes that action on their behalf. Now, you've been involved with the league for quite some time, over 16 years now with the Players Association. And so really, you've witnessed the coming online of social media. You've seen this change in the availability, the, the ability for athletes to uh, to have direct interaction with their fans in both directions, from their fans back to them as well. So what are the things that you've noticed as these technologies have come online? How has that affected the work that you all have to do? Well, I think, you know, one important factor here is since, you know, Online engagement has become so important, not only to the athlete, but, you know, potential marketing and sponsorship deals is, you know, the players focus on that online hygiene becomes that much more important relative to, let's say, a decade, a decade and a half ago. So their interest in maintaining that online hygiene is extremely important if they want the top sponsors or, or marketing activation deals to take place. So that's that's one important factor. Uh, the other important factor, if I go back a decade and a half, when as an association and or individuals, we use, you know, dial up to get online. Our presence online was fairly intermittent. In today's world, uh, with the proliferation of mobile devices and Wi-Fi, our online access is fairly ubiquitous. And realistically, players are online in some capacity or another uh, all the time, allowing them to you know, engage their, their community online all the time. But that also puts the responsibility back on them, handlers or the NHLPA, to be involved as well all the time so that in the event you know, something happens in a nefarious way uh, that we can take action and remediate and make sure that that brand is far removed from any uh, detriment uh, that would impact the, the player and his brand viability. So what are some of the lessons that you've learned that you think could uh, be applied to regular folks like you and me, folks who are not uh, high status professional athletes? What sorts of things uh, would you recommend for us based on the experiences that you have from working with athletes? When I work with athletes, I inform them of a couple of things. Keep in mind here that the NHLPA, you know, operates uh, in a capacity that isn't typical uh, in a corporate environment. It's more of an at an arm's length with the player. You know, we, we can't mandate policy. They're not a corporate staff member. Uh, so they operate fairly autonomously. Uh, so if I'm able to, you know, discuss a relationship with them, I would say, you know, any discussion I would have with them regarding security is a discussion I can also have with yourself or anyone else in the world for that matter. Uh, and a couple of things, you know, in, in terms of your online uh, presence, I would say, and I tell players this, is make sure you tell your community uh, followers enough, but not too much. 
Uh, for instance, uh, you know, too intimate of discussion uh, can be used against you in a nefarious way. Let's say if individuals who are nefarious and don that black hat are able to glean uh, from your online profile very intimate information, uh, this would make for, you know, a very a well-equipped spear uh, phishing attack uh, in a way that, you know, players might not be able to glean the intention uh, of the email only because the person sending the email uh, would have used the information online against them. So, you know, one word of advice I give to players is tell your online community enough information to build that level of engagement that is meaningful to them, uh, but don't give away uh, too much information in terms of the information that can be used against you. So that's an important factor there. Secondly, when players are involved, and celebrities for that matter, these are highly traveled individuals, uh, both uh, domestically and internationally. Uh, and a person has to be extremely mindful in terms of uh, what they do when they travel internationally. Uh, so when they travel, both domestically and internationally, you know, a word of advice is when you're when you're jumping on hotel Wi-Fi, you know, ensure that access point uh, is a trusted access point. Number one and number two, you know, I always suggest that a player uh, or a celebrity, for that matter, utilize a, a VPN to encrypt that traffic. Uh, to secure their traffic uh, from prying eyes. That's always an important uh, matter as well. It's natural for us to put professional athletes uh, on a bit of a pedestal to think that with the status, the, the skills that they have, that uh, certainly uh, they're people that we look up to. But when it comes to this sort of targeted attacks, I mean, they're, they're just as human as the rest of us. They have the same weaknesses uh, to be spearfish, the same interests, the, the same uh, human frailties that all of us have. Exactly. I mean, your, your point is well taken. Uh, they are on a pedestal, but uh, in terms of their vulnerability, they're, they're just like everybody else. Every bit as touchable uh, as, as the common person. So, and, and to a larger extent, I would suggest that uh, their vulnerability is, is, is more so than the, than the average individual, uh, only given that they're in the limelight. Uh, you know, they represent a high value proposition target. They're not necessarily uh, part or affiliated uh, with any corporation uh, that may mandate a security policy or put software uh, on various endpoints. So in a lot of ways, you know, they represent uh, individuals, I would say, that may be more vulnerable than the common person. And, uh, you know, while they are uh, holding that status of a person of notoriety, because they are highly targeted, they learn more it's more than the common person would only because they are that target and they, they see those nefarious actions uh, more so than the common person. All right. So interesting perspective, Joe. Interesting indeed. Yes. I like that he has the onboarding process where they have a two day intensive security orientation for new players. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, however, offer a suggestion. My concern is that over time, these attacks and the, and the threats are going to evolve and change and adapt to the environment because we live in a dynamic world. Right. So I would recommend that every year that the uh, Players Association offer up an annual security briefing. It should definitely be something that they offer. Yeah, yeah, and and they may very well do that. They I, might it's not not an area he we didn't covered. specifically uh, mention it. Yeah, it's interesting to hear about the things that face professional athletes. Uh, I guess something you and I don't have to worry about, right? Well, uh, not not yet. I mean, the we years are podcast are we, famous. Are we, Dave. <laughs> Well, everyone, thanks as always for listening. Thanks to the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more about them at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Editor is John Petrick. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thank you.